are again back for more on menopause in general and endometrial uterine cancer in particular. <laughs> I am Menopause Taylor, a gynecologist who teaches you everything there is to know about menopause. I'm just determined to give you the menopause education you deserve. So I present the information in a very orderly, organized manner for you, and I cover everything in units. That way, all you have to do in order to easily connect all the dots is watch my videos in order. So this is video number 327, and it's part of our big unit on endometrial uterine cancer. It's the eighth video in the unit requiring you to watch the seven videos before it in this unit if you want any chance at understanding endometrial uterine cancer. Not only that, it requires you to watch the 326 videos before it if you want to understand menopause. <laughs> I know it sounds daunting. <laughs> but hey, we're talking about the entire second half of your life. Why would you expect learning what you need to know for managing it to be quick? Now this particular video is on the diagnosis of endometrial uterine cancer. In other words, if you bleed when you shouldn't bleed, indicating that you are sloughing the stuffing, <laughs> how do you determine if you do or do not have endometrial uterine cancer or precancer? All of chapter 31 in my book is on endometrial cancer in both editions, first and second. But of course, I will demonstrate things in this video that are not in the book. In the last video, I explained that endometrial uterine cancer and precancer are things we tend to diagnose very early because they cause you to bleed when you shouldn't bleed. You slough the stuffing early in the process of cancer development. And because this is such a common, obvious, early symptom, it alerts you to the fact that you need an evaluation for the bleeding. This early, obvious sloughing of the stuffing is precisely why we don't need a screening test for endometrial uterine cancer. A screening test is for a cancer that does not produce any early warning signs or symptoms. The goal of the screening test is to detect the presence of a disease before symptoms develop precisely because symptoms develop late. So we have screening tests for many different kinds of cancers, but we do not have a screening test for endometrial uterine cancer. Instead, if you bleed when you shouldn't bleed, you need an evaluation. And the evaluation serves the purpose of determining where the bleeding originated, why you're bleeding, if the bleeding is due to endometrial uterine cancer or precancer, and what constitutes the appropriate treatment, if any. So be sure to separate the meanings of a screening test and an evaluation. A screening test is something that is recommended to the public at large when they are asymptomatic to identify those who might have a disease before any symptoms develop. But because it's done on everybody, there are a lot of false alarms. In contrast, an evaluation is done only on people who manifest a specific symptom that warrants explanation. You know, I always try to come up with good analogies for what we're studying. I think they help you remember the lesson. So, a good analogy for why we don't need a screening test for endometrial uterine cancer is the process of progressing from one class level to the next in school. If you complete the year with passing marks in school for one level, you automatically get enrolled in the next level for the following year. You don't have to take some sort of entry exam or screening test on the first day to prove that you belong there. The fact that you completed the previous year satisfactorily is proof enough. Likewise, bleeding when you shouldn't bleed is proof enough that you need an evaluation for the cause of the bleeding. 
So an evaluation does two things. It rules out false diagnoses and it rules in an actual diagnosis. So an evaluation tells us what it is and what it isn't. Now, sometimes an evaluation fails to nail down a specific diagnosis. And sometimes the precise diagnosis is never found. But the evaluation is still useful in ruling out all the things it is not. So let's examine what an evaluation entails for bleeding when you shouldn't bleed. We'll start with a typical case scenario in which you are a peri or postmenopausal woman, either taking HRT on a cyclic or continuous regimen or not taking HRT at all. And you have vaginal bleeding when you shouldn't. What happens next? That's what an evaluation is. Notice, though, that you can be either perimenopausal or postmenopausal. Notice also that you can be taking HRT or not taking HRT. And if you are taking HRT, you can be on either a cyclic regimen or a continuous regimen. So regardless of your age, Regardless of your menopausal status and regardless of your menopause management style, all bleeding when you shouldn't be bleeding gets evaluated. In medicine, doctors have certain mindsets that dictate how we evaluate a situation. In the case of bleeding when you shouldn't bleed, the mindset is that all bleeding is endometrial uterine cancer until proven otherwise. Now that does not mean that endometrial uterine cancer is likely or even common. It's just a mindset that prevents missing the diagnosis. We doctors have many other mindsets like this too. For instance, we obstetricians operate under the mindset that everyone is pregnant until proven otherwise. It doesn't matter whether you're male or female, young or old, fertile, fertile or infertile, premenopausal, perimenopausal, or postmenopausal. No, we take it to extremes. Everyone is pregnant until proven otherwise. And that way, we will never overlook the possibility of a pregnancy. So when it comes to bleeding when you shouldn't bleed, all bleeding gets evaluated regardless of your circumstance. The evaluation of bleeding when you shouldn't bleed consists of four different things. A history of the bleeding, a physical examination of your vagina and cervix, a pelvic ultrasound, and sampling of the endometrial cells. So I'll discuss each of these starting with the history. The very first thing your doctor should do is ask you questions to learn more about the nature of your bleeding. These questions serve to narrow down the possibilities. So depending on the timing, quantity, nature, and color of the blood, your doctor can surmise as to the most likely site of origin. He or she will question you about when the bleeding started and how many times it has occurred. There should be questions about how frequently you've bled. Your doctor should ask about any other symptoms you have that are associated with the bleeding. And your doctor should ask questions about whether you bleed during or after intercourse. He or she should inquire about the quantity of blood you've noticed. And he or she should inquire about any medications or herbs you are taking. You see, the answers to these questions help your doctor decide what to do next. And be sure your doctor listens to your story about the details of your bleeding. Once you've given the history, the next part of the evaluation is the physical exam. Evaluation, exam. Do you notice how all these words fit really well with our school analogy? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay, so earlier I said that the bleeding could be coming from any part of your reproductive tract, right? So a physical exam enables your doctor to see the areas that you can't see yourself, like your vagina and your cervix. 
So your doctor will do a pelvic exam to ensure that the bleeding is not coming from a visible lesion in your vagina or your cervix, which your doctor can see even though you can't. If the site of the bleeding is not visible, it's time to look at the parts of your reproductive tract that neither you nor your doctor can see with your eyes alone. And the most important of those is your uterus, which of course is inside, here. Now, this brings us to the third and fourth parts of the evaluation. And there are two different levels of evaluating your uterus. One is to look at your endometrial lining grossly, and the other is to look at your endometrial cells specifically and microscopically. We can assess your endometrial lining grossly with ultrasound, and we can assess your endometrial cells microscopically by collecting a specimen of them by some type of biopsy, and most of the time you need both. So pelvic ultrasound is the third part of the evaluation. It's a procedure that looks at the uterus and literally measures the thickness of your uterine lining. And there are two ways of performing a pelvic ultrasound, abdominally and vaginally. The vaginal approach is better by far for purposes of evaluating bleeding when you shouldn't bleed. It enables the probe of the ultrasound to get much closer to your uterus. So as long as there's no impediment to a vaginal pelvic ultrasound, that's the one you should have. The goal of a pelvic ultrasound is to measure the thickness of your inner uterine lining. As I've told you previously, the name of the tissue that constitutes your inner uterine lining is endometrium. So you want to measure the endometrial thickness. Now, notice that with any part of your anatomy, when you look at it on an imaging study, like a pelvic ultrasound, you can demonstrate it and view it from different angles. When I show you this model of your uterus, using my avocado models. I have cut the avocado at an angle that separates the front of your uterus from the back of your uterus. And that helps you see how thick this inner uterine lining is. Okay, but that doesn't work very well for ultrasound. With ultrasound, what you want to do is look at your uterus at an angle that separates your uterus in half from side to side. So this is a model of your entire pelvis and it's really the right half of a body. And you can see that the uterus here is from the same angle that you would want to see it on an ultrasound for purposes of measuring your endometrial lining. So if I take off this piece here, what you see is this is the uterus right here, okay? This is the same angle that you want to use for ultrasound because this is the only way you're going to be able to measure the thickness of the endometrial lining. Now I have this other side here, smaller, and you can see that there's a area here, all of this, that can be measured. And the only way I can see how thick this endometrial lining is right here is to view it this way. If I view it this way, it's not going to tell me as much. Here's an analogy using bread. If I take this loaf of bread and I cut it this way from front to back, I get this, I get two sides. One is the bottom, one is the top, but it's front to back, okay? There are two halves of the sides of bread. But if I take the loaf and instead, I cut it in half from side to side, 
I get this. This is what we want. We want this view for measuring the thickness of your endometrial lining on pelvic ultrasound. Remember, a pelvic ultrasound is an imaging study that is not as clear-cut and obvious as these uterine models. Most people looking at an ultrasound cannot recognize anything. Here's what your uterus looks like on an ultrasound. What you see here is a uterus as if you cut it into right and left sides, like the model I showed you, and that horizontal white line represents what is called the endometrial stripe. That's what the radiologist measures to determine the thickness of your endometrial lining. You know, it's a lot like looking at a peanut butter and jelly sandwich <laughs> from the side. <laughs> Here, <laughs> I actually have the bottom half of a so-called peanut butter and jelly sandwich, but not really jelly, I'll tell you in a minute. The bread represents the thick muscular wall on the bottom or back surface of the uterus. The peanut butter represents the endometrial layer of cells that require evaluation. That would be this brown layer here. And the thin layer of jelly, but it's really vegan mayonnaise because mayonnaise is white and the white stripe on ultrasound works better for white. So the mayonnaise is white and that is consistent with the white line you see on ultrasound. So I'm going, to rep you, I'm going to represent the demarcation between the upper and lower halves of your uterus by that white line, which is the vegan mayonnaise. Okay? In other words, the mayonnaise represents the empty space between the top and bottom surfaces of your endometrial lining. Now here, I have the other side of the sandwich, and it consists also of bread, which represents the thick muscular wall on the top or front surface of your uterus, okay? And the peanut butter represents the top layer of endometrial cells that require evaluation. So if I make it an actual sandwich like this, you can see what you see on ultrasound. You see, looking from the side like this, that this enables you to measure the depth of the peanut butter on top plus the depth of the peanut butter on the bottom. And the sum of the two is your endometrial thickness. The formal name for this measurement, peanut butter, <laughs> is, in, is the endometrial stripe. And your endometrial stripe is normal if it is less than four millimeters thick. If it's more, than four millimeters thick. It is too thick. So an ultrasound determines how thick the peanut butter is. Now, while this is a good analogy, in some ways the implications don't fit our needs because I don't know about you, but for me, the thicker the peanut butter, <laughs> the better. <laughs> but for your endometrial stripe, just the opposite is true. So I guess I should have used something that everybody hates to demonstrate your endometrial stripe. I just love peanut butter, <laughs> and I'm going to have a hard time ignoring that peanut butter and, <laughs> and that sandwich right now. And you know that I'm going to eat it as soon as I'm finished. <laughs> so using our uterine model again, the measurement we're going to take constitutes the thickness of the endometrium on both sides of the stripe. So it's the top plus the bottom. That is the measurement. And if we do it on our other model, it's the thickness here of the two pink areas, top and bottom. This is the muscular layer. This area here is the endometrium. And if it measures more than four millimeters total, it's too thick. The risk of having endometrial uterine cancer with a measurement less than four millimeters is one in 917. So the four millimeter cutoff finds more than 98% of endometrial uterine cancers. But 
All you know thus far in the evaluation by ultrasound is that it's too thick. You don't know anything about what's making it too thick. Both frank endometrial uterine cancer and precancer can make it too thick. So this is where the fourth part of the evaluation, the biopsy, comes in. And the biopsy is a sampling of the endometrial cells. The goal with sampling of your endometrial cells is to collect a sample that reflects what's going on in your uterus to cause the bleeding. This is the part of the evaluation that should provide an actual diagnosis. So this is really the most important part. The process of a sampling involves collecting endometrial cells from the lining inside your uterus and sending them to the pathology lab for examination under the microscope. And that way you determine on a microscopic cellular level what's going on. In video 325, I showed you that there is a progression of cellular abnormalities that lead to endometrial uterine cancer. Remember this board? Here you have everything from simple hyperplasia to progressive degrees of dysplasia to progressive degrees of neoplasia. And nothing in the evaluation thus far has designated which of these is causing the bleeding. But the endometrial sampling will. Like pelvic ultrasound, there are different ways to perform endometrial sampling, and they vary in many different ways. I'm going to divide the different ways of performing an endometrial sampling into two different categories based on visibility and totality. Now I know that sounds kind of confusing right now, but just a minute and I'll clear it up. The first factor is what I've called visibility. This is because some types of endometrial sampling are done blindly. In other words, your doctor collects the sample but cannot see the inside of your uterine cavity while doing so. He or she inserts some type of device and collects cells from your endometrial cavity without being able to see what your endometrium looks like and without being able to see where the sample is taken. Other endometrial sampling techniques are performed under direct visualization. They enable your doctor to actually see inside your uterus while collecting the sample. And that means he or she can see what your endometrium looks like and where the sample is coming from. The second factor is what I've called totality. And by this, I mean that some devices collect a sample of endometrial cells from your entire endometrial surface, whereas others only collect random samples from a portion of your endometrial surface. Obviously, the more complete the sampling, the more accurate the diagnosis. If a biopsy device samples a normal area of your endometrial line, lining but misses an abnormal area, your diagnosis could be incorrect or missed altogether. Some abnormalities affect the entire endometrial cavity. Others do not. So how the sampling is done can affect your ability to get an accurate diagnosis. So, there are three different techniques for sampling your endometrial lining. They are dilatation and curatage, endometrial biopsy, and hysteroscopy. I'll discuss each of those. The first technique for sampling your endometrial lining is a dilatation and curatage. You probably know this as a DMC. D is for dilatation. C is for curatage, and the word and separates them. I've heard many women say D-N-C with the letter N between the D and the C. It's not an N, it's the word and. A lot of women do the same thing when it comes to sex and the city. It's sex and the city, not sex in the city. <laughs> anyway, the word dilatation means to dilate. Remember, your cervix is nothing but a door to your uterus, and it's a very tiny door that is usually 
closed. It's way up there in the top of your vagina, and if you can't, you might be able to see this, but it's way up there, and it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little door. And it's just like the hole in a bagel. All it does is open and close, open and close to let things go in and out of your uterus. And it only opens wide for delivery of a baby. When you're postmenopausal, though, it's typically closed. Well, we're talking about performing a procedure in which your doctor has to insert an instrument in order to collect some of your endometrial lining. So he or she has to dilate your closed cervix or open the door a bit in order to do that. So dilatation involves inserting probes that gradually increase in size to widen the opening and make that bagel hole large enough to insert the necessary instruments. You know, these dilation devices are a lot like varying sizes of makeup brushes. You know, there's one. This one's a little bit larger. This one is a little bit larger. This one is a little bit larger. And this one's even larger. Makeup brushes. Who would have thought? Now, you know, the only reason I have these is because Dominique Saxa made me buy them for that collaborative video we did in which she applied my makeup. And of course, I haven't used them since because I don't wear makeup. I hate the stuff. <laughs> but this just goes to show that makeup brushes can be quite similar to surgical instruments. <laughs> the difference is that the dilators used for dilating your cervix are longer and they have no brush attached. <laughs> so once your cervix is dilated, the next step is to insert a device that can collect a sample of your endometrial lining. For a DNC, that device looks somewhat like a cross between a bubble wand and a spoon. Remember these bubble wands you used as a kid and you dipped them in soap and then, you know, you made beautiful bu bubbles with them? This was always so much fun. <laughs> I guess you're supposed to blow it, right? There we go. <laughs> but I want a real bubble. Beautiful. <laughs> so, the difference though is the instrument used to perform a DNC has a deeper rim and it's more like a spoon with a big hole in it. So imagine a hole in the spoon. And your doctor inserts this device and uses it to scrape the interior of your uterine cavity and collect endometrial cells. Now the medical term for scraping is curatage. DNC was the traditional method for endometrial sampling until about 1975. But there are shortcomings to DNC as a means of collecting endometrial cells. The first shortcoming is that it requires general anesthesia. Dilating and scraping are too painful to do them without it. And the second shortcoming is that DNC is done blindly. Your doctor cannot see where he or she is scraping or if they are sampling the entire endometrial cavity. As much as 50% of your endometrium may go unsampling, unsampled. Here, I have what's left of a cup of chocolate pudding. I've eaten most of it so that there's just a little bit left clinging to the walls of this cup to represent your endometrial lining. If I take this spoon and I blindly try to remove the chocolate pudding, I am going to end up leaving some behind. And that's pretty much what happens with the DNC. See, so the sides are not completely clean. And it's because I couldn't see what I was doing. I'd left some behind. In the 1970s, the DNC was replaced by an in-office sampling device called an endometrial biopsy device. As the name implies, it's a device for sampling the endometrial tissue, but it can be done in the office without anesthesia. The biopsy is called an endometrial biopsy, or EMB. That's because it's a biopsy of endometrial tissue inside your uterus. 
The most common device used for doing an endometrial biopsy is a tiny, tiny little suction device. So to demonstrate, here is a typical drinking straw, okay? And next to it I have an endometrial biopsy device. As you can see, it's very tiny. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny little catheter. And because this catheter is so tiny, there's no need to dilate your cervix. It's usually possible to slide this right into your uterus. Occasionally it's not possible, but most of the time it is. So your doctor inserts this through the opening in your cervix up into your endometrial cavity and then just pulls back on a piston to cause suction. But compared to the size of your entire endometrial cavity here, this little suction device is teeny, teeny, tiny. And this is used blindly also. So if you have an abnormality that does not include your entire endometrial lining, this device could miss it. On average, this only samples 4% of your entire endometrial cavity. So compared to a D and C, these E and B devices represent a trade-off of convenience for an inferior specimen. Because of the blind nature of both DNC and EMB, as well as their inability to sample the entire endometrial cavity, a negative result is never a final diagnosis. If the results of your DNC or EMB are negative, you usually have to proceed to the next step, which is also the next option for endometrial sampling hysteroscopy. As usual, whenever you hear a big word, just break it down into its component parts. You know that hist means uterus, and scope refers to an instrument that enables you to see something. So a hysteroscope is a device that enables your doctor to look inside your uterus, and the word hysteroscopy is the process of looking inside your uterus. So imagine being able to attach a camera to this EMB device and see what I'm sampling. That would increase the reliability and accuracy of the biopsy. And I could still do it in the office setting without anesthesia. Obviously, I still would not be sampling the entire endometrial cavity, but by seeing the cavity, I could choose the sites that look most abnormal and sample them. Or if I use a larger scope to do the sampling and can see what I'm doing through the scope, I'll get an even more thorough sample. So this is the most effective way to get an endometrial sample that will provide an accurate diagnosis. And there are some larger devices that instead of sampling just a little bit of your endometrial tissue, they apply complete suction to the entire cavity and remove all your endometrial tissue so that all of it goes to the pathology lab for microscopic evaluation. Of course, all these gadgets cost money and the more sophisticated the gadget, the fewer the number of physicians who have it or know how to operate it. And then there's the matter of cost. The more sophisticated, the higher the cost of performing the biopsy. And if insurance is involved, there may be a limit on what they'll pay. In any case, the goal is to obtain tissue in order to label the bleeding with an accurate diagnosis. And I think it's good for you to know about the different instruments for doing so. All tissue collected by any of these means goes to the pathology department for evaluation under the microscope. Sometimes the pathologist returns a diagnosis of tissue insufficient for diagnosis or quantity not sufficient for diagnosis. And they both mean that there is still no diagnosis. Either there just isn't enough tissue to make a diagnosis or the tissue is so confusing that the pathologist can't label it as one thing or another. Fortunately, this happens fairly infrequently. And the evaluation of bleeding when you shouldn't bleed turns out to be endometrial uterine cancer only 9% of the time. And if you do have endometrial uterine cancer, the combination of the pelvic ultrasound 
and endometrial sampling usually provide an accurate diagnosis on which to designate the grade of disease. So next week, we'll discuss grading as well as staging of endometrial uterine cancer. So this process of assessing endometrial uterine cancer really is a lot like moving through your school curriculum. Your bleeding was proof that you warranted an evaluation without the need for a screening test, just like completing one school year proved that you were ready for the next. But once you were in the midst of a school year, you had to take exams to evaluate your status, just like the evaluation of your uterus gives you a diagnosis to designate your uterine status. So here's the summary for today. Endometrial uterine cancer and precancer produce obvious bleeding as an early symptom. All bleeding warrants an evaluation. After history and physical exam, the evaluation consists of a pelvic ultrasound to measure the thickness of your endometrial lining and a sampling of endometrial cells for microscopic evaluation. And this provides a diagnosis and determines treatment. Oh. Okie dokie. There you have it, ladies. Between now and next week, please go to menopausetaylor.me to schedule consultations and buy educational resources. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram anytime. And no matter what, you should subscribe to both my YouTube channel and my newsletter. I will see you in a week. Hmm. Peanut butter and mayonnaise. Not bad. Bye. <laughs>